Well, thanks everyone for showing up. Um, we're going to spend the next, I think, almost an hour and a half uh, running through a tutorial or workshop on getting started with serverless WebAssembly with SPIN. My name is uh, Mikkel, and I am part of a company called Fermion. I have one colleague with me up here, Matt, who will be helping out during the tutorial. Um, and Fermion is a company who built this open source project called SPIN, which is all about serverless WebAssembly. So during the next hour and a half, you get some first-hand experience with server-side WebAssembly. You get some familiarity with the SPIN framework and a lot of the features we have in that framework. And we can end up doing deployment of SPIN applications into a cloud offering that we provide, which is called Fermion Cloud. And we can also play around with deploying into Kubernetes. There's a fairly new serverless AI feature we built on all of this, uh, which you can go and sign up to here. It's part of the workshop, so we'll get to that step later as well uh, as we go along. So there's sort of, when we do this tutorial, we've done it a few times by now, there are, there are typically like two paths that people can sort of choose to do. One, self-guided, go and have fun, proceed the workshop at your own pace. All, everything you need to go through the workshop and tutorials is, is on this GitHub repository. It's a QR code here to easily get there. It's slash Fermion slash workshops on GitHub. I will also, um, the second option, you can even mix and match these, but I'll spend a little bit of time to begin with introducing the concepts behind uh, serverless WebAssembly uh, and SPIN as a framework as well. And then I'll do, I'll basically walk through the tutorial up here as well, so you can feel free to sort of follow along what I do. Again, go on your own pace. If you go on your own pace and, you know, you have things along the way where you need some help or you have some questions, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll deal with it um, as we go along. Okay, so let me start doing a little bit of introduction about uh, WebAssembly um, and what this whole serverless server side <laughs> Uh, WebAssembly thing is all about. A few things that is always a good place to start, you know, when we talk about WebAssembly, what's, what's important to know about that is that, first of all, it is a specification, right? It's a specification of a binary instruction format. It's designed to be a portable compilation target. Okay, that might not mean a whole lot of things, but we'll sort of unfold that as we go along. Um, the specification and technology originates from the browser. So when I talk about serverless WebAssembly, we talk about an implementation of WebAssembly specification to enable you to run WebAssembly outside of the browser. It's important to uh, sort of state up front, I would say, that so programming language support, it is emerging and it is stabilizing. So depending on what your favorite programming language is, there is various degree of support for WebAssembly um, outside of the browser or server side. And if along the way I say WASM, it's interchangeable with WebAssembly. It's basically the same thing, so just bear over with me. Again, it's just good to know WASM WebAssembly, it's the same thing. So when we talk about this being a binary instruction format that is portable uh, across operating systems and platform, what does that really mean? Well, it means that the path from writing your code, compiling it and running it is sort of a, th a two-step thing. First of all, you have your code that will compile into WASM or WebAssembly, which is the binary format. Once you have your code compiled into that format, and that, that format is the same uh, irrespective of what programming language you started out with, whether you started out in Rust, JavaScript, Python, Go, any of those languages, you always get a WebAssembly uh, binary uh, once you compile them. There are various ways this happened depending on the programming languages. Uh, uh, Matt did a great a uh, small YouTube video once where he sort of walked through the various methodologies based on those, based on those um, different languages. But once you have that and you need to run it, then you start running these inside a WebAssembly runtime, which is basically a small virtual machine that's being set up that can run that WebAssembly. And there are some, probably some, some well-known technologies in here or references to things like how the Java virtual machine uh, runs, but also if you look at this in context of, of a browser, uh, the virtual machines inside the browser would be the JavaScript engines like the V8s and those type of things. Okay, so that's how we make WebAssembly uh, portable, and that's sort of, sort of how this all uh, works. If we just talk a little bit about the whole runtime and uh, VMs and what that means, I've created this sort of 
overview of the JavaScript-based runtimes and the WASI runtimes. So I talked about being in the browser, being outside of the browser, and this is sort of the same distinguishing I'm doing here. These are all the browser-based runtimes. And the reason why I call them JavaScript is because the way that you bind from the WebAssembly to the web browser APIs is through some JavaScript glue code that's part of it. So those runtimes are designed to complement and run alongside JavaScript, your web assemblies, right? And that's uh, examples of things like V8, which are used in Chromium browsers, or SpiderMonkey used in Firefox. You can actually do stuff with Node.js around that as well as an opportunity, uh, as a possibility. On the other hand, we have what I talked about as the uh, server-side web assembly, or the stuff that runs outside of the browser. We can also talk about these as WASI runtimes, and WASI is a... Um, I lost that English word. It's the, it, it stands for <laughs> the WebAssembly System Interface. What do you call it? Acronym. acronym. Yeah, an acronym. Thanks. Uh, so the WASI runtime, that's the WebAssembly System Interface. And basically, the WebAssembly System Interface are those APIs that enable your WebAssembly to get access to something that reminds of an operating system, as opposed to in the JavaScript side of things, you get access to APIs that are browser-based APIs, right? So you get access to write through the DOM and those type of things over there. You'll get access to things like files and so on and so forth. And there's a, there's a, a, a list of uh, runtimes that support WASI over here. WASM time being the most predominant one, which is also what we use in our framework. Um, and there actually is experimental support in Node.js as well on that side. Okay, so what is it that makes these WebAssembly so great? Right, and why, why, why does it matter to talk about having WebAssembly running outside of the browser when the specification was designed to, you know, enhance browser experiences and browser applications? I believe there are these four basic things that are part of the specification that makes this really, really compelling. First of all, the binary size. If you look at a server-side WebAssembly, you can do a Rust Hello World example that is approximately compiled into a two megabyte binary file. And it's important to remember that that binary file is actually uh, portable. It can run on any operating system or any processing architecture, as long as it gets loaded by that virtual machine. Now, you can, ahead of time, compile it to a specific architecture and a specific operating system, and it becomes a 300 kilobyte file. And if you look at how we use the spin framework on this, the comparable uh, numbers of sizes is 2.3 megabyte and 1.1 megabyte. So, 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 you can see how in the browser it's important that you have binaries that you want to execute that are very, very small because you always fetch whatever you need to execute from a remote host over the internet, right? So that's what, what this is designed for. And, and being able to write server-side services uh, with, that, uh, with a characteristic like this and these small sizes that are on top of that also portable um, is really, really compelling. Startup times are comparable with natively compiled code. The best numbers I can find is that it's only 2.3 times slower than natively compiled. But that's actually a comparison of the, 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 uh, the just-in-time compiled version. If you do the ahead-of-time compilation, you'll get much, much faster execution of startup times here. So obviously, there's a trade-off, right? You can, you can compile something natively, and that, that works on that particular platform and, and so on. Uh, but you can actually maintain portability and still get some very, very quick startup times. I think I touched on the portability <laughs> already a few times now. The last thing here is the security part. Again, coming from the browser, everything you execute in the browser is, you know, is, is non-trusted code, right? It's being downloaded from a remote host and you execute it and you don't want it to escape its own execution context. So everything runs in these sandboxed environments uh, in the WebAssembly runtime. There's even this thing um, called a capability-based security model, which means that I mentioned before that part of the WASI specification, which is the system interface, which is the APIs that you have if you're WebAssembly running outside of the browser, you could have access to the file system, for instance. Whenever you run a WebAssembly in one of those runtimes, they don't have any files unless you specifically, at runtime, define which part of the file system would be accessible for that WebAssembly. And that's sort of an example of this capability-based security model. You, as the one operating or running that uh, program, specifically designs what or decides at that time uh, what capabilities the program will have outside of its sandbox. Now, these are all really, really awesome things to have if you need to operate and run stuff, uh, you know, uh, servers or server-side. 
And so if we, if we try to, to look across that and the, the use cases where the, uh, the WebAssembly system interface makes, makes really good sense, and we have sort of these four base characteristics as, as the foundation of that, um, part of what we believe and what we've uh, set out to achieve with the SPIN uh, open source framework is really to build some development operator experiences that are, you know, that we quite haven't seen before. Uh, so both Matt and I and a lot of other people from, from the company Fermion have a background um, building cloud services uh, from various big cloud providers. And, and in that space, at least you know, from a developer's point of view, there's always been like a little bit of a holy grail around the Heroku experience. That's sort of been you know, the, the thing that everyone is trying to, you know, to get towards in, in the new world of cloud native. And I think, I think what we believe with this whole web uh, assembly technology is like we actually have a foundational technology now that would enable us to do what we can do with containers today and what we do with containers today but in a much, much better way in terms of the developer and operator experiences we'll get. So as we go through this workshop, I hope you sort of get a feeling of that and you can see where these things are going. Um, so the three, the three main use cases on, on top of all of these are primarily around cloud and plugins and IoT. I mentioned cloud already. The functions as a service types of framework, which is what SPIN is, is definitely a really, really good use case. Uh, if you think, think about plugins, there are various scenarios where people use the server-side WebAssembly to implement user-defined functions in databases, for instance, meaning that if you have a database, you can write uh, a function, compile to WebAssembly, and run that inside the database. Uh, I know, is it, I think it's Mongo that already has support for that. One of, one of the databases, one of the open source databases do have that type of support for WebAssembly today. But also, if you're in a scenario where you run a SaaS platform and you want to have your customers or your users extend that platform with their own code, because of the security model, because of the portability and all of that, it's also a really good use case. And then on the IoT side, obviously, the system resource uses and the fact that once you have a compiled WebAssembly binary, it doesn't need any other dependencies that the actual runtime to run there. So again, comparing that to trying to use things like containers in an IoT scenario, which is very he heavy on the resource usage, and also often heavy in size, this is a really, really good progression on that. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that the language support, the programming language support for WebAssembly is emerging. Uh, and I think, I think I said emerging and stabilizing, so you can interpret that the way you want. Uh, we've compiled this uh, language support uh, overview uh, that we have on our website. I think the QR code will take you there. Uh, so that's a really good place to go and take a look and sort of get an update on your favorite programming language or the programming languages that you use and the state of support across uh, the browser and WASI and what we have in the SDKs for SPIN. Uh, so I definitely recommend go and take a look at that. Okay, so that was sort of the core of the WebAssembly server side. You know, what are all the benefits in this technology and some of these things? And now I'm going to move into how we use that in this framework that we call SPIN. Um, so this is the developer tool, we believe. It's a, well, it is one developer tool to build serverless web, WebAssembly applications. Um, so I'll start to unfold that a little bit and, 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 and talk about what that is. Um, disregard the SPIN 1.0, we just released the SPIN 1.5 last week. Uh, so so we, are, we are somewhat ahead of this. But when we talk about this as a tool for building serverless applications, what do we mean? Well, there's sort of a natural flow in around the developer experience and, and operations ex, operator experiences for using Spin, which are tied to these three commands, which we have like you know Spin new to start creating applications, Spin build to compile the WebAssembly, and Spin up obviously to run your WebAssembly. Um, if we look at the Spin new, we have a variety of programming languages supporting uh, Spin with SDKs that you can use. The most uh, furthest ahead programming languages would be Rust. JavaScript, TypeScript, I think Python comes in, in the uh, Python and Go probably comes in on the close third. We do have some .NET experimentation we've been doing as well, but there's a lot of various programming languages you can use. And because we have, because we end up compiling everything down to WebAssembly, what obviously happens once we go, you know, ahead from 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 programming to compilation, is when we run things with spin up. We don't care about where you started in terms of programming languages because all we have to run are WebAssembly. 
right? It's all the same binary format, which means the operator experience on this side is highly simplified, even though that we give a lot of, get a lot of opportunities as developers when we start out things. So along the way of that, there's there, what we build into the frameworks world is what we believe is essential for a lot of developers today, which is you know, easy access through a set of APIs to all of, you know, a lot of the supporting services that you would need. So easily being able to call remote endpoints through HTTP, uh, having access to key value storage is also built into the framework. Basically means there's an API directly in the framework to set and get things from a store that is persisted uh, across requests, getting access to SQL databases, and the latest thing we just introduced is having, having a large language, large language model interface as well. So you can run inferencing based on a set of uh, uh, inferencing models that we provide. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, in the whole operations, operation space, being able to um, uh, package these things up as uh, OCI compatible uh, images or artifacts, so we can easily use registries to move them around, pull them down, and you know, sign them and all these things, and finally run them either just like locally, spin as a CLI, so you can always run a spin up command on any machine you want. So if you want to do something around system D or something else, do that on your own, you can do that. You can use the cloud that we built. Uh, we have a reference implementation of our cloud called Fermion Platform as well, which is built on top of uh, uh, Nomad as an orchestration technology and a lot of other uh, technologies around that. Um, and then there's a, there's a project called Run Wasi under the container D um, CNCF project to enable you to run uh, a variety of WebAssembly runtimes inside of Kubernetes cluster. So Spin would also be able to be deployed to a Kubernetes cluster and it's part of the tutorial and the workshop as well. And you can, if you get time now, you can try that out here or you can try that out later if you want to go back to the workshop. So, sort of gives you an overview of the, the features and functionality that are inside of Spin. Um, I think we mentioned the, the top row has been mentioned so far. Um, the core concept with Spin, and one of the reasons why we call these serverless, is because the model is very similar to what uh, services um, or frameworks like Amazon's Lambda or Azure Functions do, is that it is, it is, a, it is a, what you write are a set of functions that are being triggered by some external event. Like typically those would be HTTP requests as, as an event, but it could also be events happening on remote storage or queue systems, like something sitting in a Redis queue or other types of things. The way that these are implemented is something we call triggers inside of Spin. And, and, and HTTP is sort of the base trigger that we do because then you can always just call an HTTP endpoint, you'll handle that, that, that request. Um, but it's basically an extensible model. So we've seen people start contributing triggers for MQTT, for instance. I think there's an Amazon SQS trigger as well out there. So you can sort of extend the framework with these type of triggers if you want, if you have scenarios that you want to do that. Um, and obviously there's a story around uh, variables and configurations and secrets as well in the framework. So a lot of this actually, I mean, we, we talk about building full stack applications, but there are actually a whole lot of stuff you can do uh, with these things being available in the framework and, and the APIs. Um, AI was the, was the new one that I mentioned that we built into the service. Um, so what we, what we enable is to use um, the initial release that we did in the 1.5 spin release is to enable you to use Meta's Llama models for inferencing and also for embedding. So there's a Llama chat and there's a Llama 2 code I believe the other name is, uh, that you can use directly from within your spin applications today. You can definitely use that on your local laptop. I would just say, you know, expect prompt generation to be in the tenths of seconds, so you know, 20, 30 seconds sometimes. Uh, but we also, what we did in uh, our cloud, and again, this could sort of be a reference implementation as well, is that we build a way to actually share access to uh, real powerful GPUs, specifically those are A100s. Uh, which means that we can get some inferencing requests into the, you know, kind of um, half a second uh, latency or startup to actually run inferencing operations. So, I mean, this, this, this is sort of interesting in itself and in the AI world of AI, but, but, but again, from the full stack development point of view, you can now start building applications where 
you know, using key value store as a persistent cache, we have some examples where we, you know, have built a small sentiment analysis application, and then we'll go in and, you know, you can combine all of these things. So if someone asks a question, it's like, you know, I'm happy today and want to figure out, have the last language model figure out whether that's a positive or negative sentiment, um, we can go and make the inference and call and we can get that reply back. But then we can actually go and store that in the key value store and say, hey, if this question comes again, we don't have to spend a lot of GPU and power, you know, generating new, another inferencing prompt. So let's just cache the, pick up the cache from the key value store. Or we can make it even more interesting and we can actually create an embedding around the question. So we can compare other questions to that embedding. So embeddings are things you do when you want to do similarity, uh, sort of comparison between sentences. And you can say, hey, if you have a 95% similarity between whatever was said and what has already been asked, let's just take the cache thing instead of doing the actual inferencing call. So having all these things available, you know, you can very easily build up these type of, um, of, uh, of workloads. Um, so that's all, all good and great. I think as we go along and you'll start sort of getting a feel about how the spin uh, framework works, you can sort of see how easy it is to just start using all these powerful features within the framework. And a lot of these examples, we have this thing we call the spin-up hub, because we need a spin-up hub, um, where you can go and find examples that we provided, that people from the community have provided of, you know, uh, applications that are ready to, to use, to deploy. There are also plugins and other templates and libraries that you can go and, and, and take a look at. Uh, so that's a, good, that's a good place to get, some, to get some inspiration around the type of applications and how you would build those with Spin. Okay, that was the introduction. That was what is server-side WebAssembly, what is the Spin framework, and a bunch of stuff going on in there. Uh, now we will move into the tutorial part of this where I think, let me just check. Um, again, if you want to move ahead at your own pace, okay, that was a long way back. Um, you can go to this GitHub repository. All the instructions and everything you need are there. It's a QR code as well. I will uh, walk through the tutorial from stage as well. So feel free to follow along and I'll hopefully extend a little bit on what's happening as we do that. Um, the actual workshop is about building a magic eight ball. Um, so there are three variations. So, so this spinning magic eight ball is this thing, you know, you can ask a question, you can shake it and it will give you a reply and you can choose whether you want to comply or not <laughs> to what it tells you. Um, but we can build this magic eight ball that returns a random response. You know, it has to remember responses to questions. I mentioned the caching thing. So that's a way for us to showcase how you can use the key value store. And then there's, uh, I don't know who came up with that AI pun down there, but that's a magic AI ball, I guess. That's how you would pronounce that, where basically the, the, the responses and questions are backed by a large, large language model and are not, you know, just a set of questions that you can, you can choose from being a magic AI ball. Uh, so if you get that far through the tutorial, you'll be able to, you'll be able to try that as well. Um, we're going to run through, there are, I think there are a lot of sections in the workshop, but basically we will write a JSON API, so consider that a backend type of service to begin with, that will just give us replies back and that will sort of start introducing you to the whole model inside of Spin where, you know, you send an HTTP request, you get a response back. Uh, we'll, we can augment that with some AI stuff by basically sending that data that is being posted through the LLM inferencing model. Then we can add a front end to the application. We can start using caching and we can deploy that into either the Fermion cloud or to Kubernetes. And then there's like a little bonus exercise in the end where you can build a lottery spinning wheel application to showcase some of the SQL Lite features that, that are there as well. Um, so another link to the same workshop. Um, before we get started, I think the logistics is basically just, you know, if you want to go on your own pace, do that. If you have questions along the way, just raise your hand. Matt will pay attention <laughs> and can come around and, and help ask, uh, answer to any questions you may have. So before we do that, any questions or anything? Like, I think we can do a little bit of Q&A right now. If... Yes, do we, do we need the microphone for recording purposes? You were talking about SQLite being available to the functions. 
does that, what's the lifetime? Does that, I'm assuming that spans across instances of the, of the function being run or the, I don't know what the right term is. Yep. No, we can call them a function. Well, I think we call them components. Okay, the yeah. components. So if I've got five instances of that running at any given time or, or over the course of half, of an, half an hour, that SQLite with persistent data would be available to all of those. Uh, yeah, so the execution, yeah, so the execution model in spin is actually because I, I mentioned the quick startup time and the small binary size is that, um, for instance, in our cloud, we never run more than a single instance of any application because every, every request or every trigger that needs to be handled, um, we have enough time to actually load the component, the web assembly, execute the, the request, the event, and just shut it down again. So you don't have any model or anything persisting between requests or between trigger actions that are happening, um, which is also why the, 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 the SQL feature is there, or the key value store is there. So that is externalized to that actual execution. So again, in the spin model, there, there, are, there are ways where you can um, define what's the implementation behind either the key value interface or the SQLite interface. Uh, when you run that locally, because with spin, you have everything locally. We just use a file-based SQLite. So that's always there and will persist across uh, requests. We have an implementation in our cloud where we use other databases, real databases. Uh, but basically, you can add a configuration to the spin application saying, I want to have a Redis server back in the key value API that is being used in this host, or I want to use this database backing the API being used in, in the host over here. So, so, so you have options in, in how you want to do that. We don't have a way today to have, if we were to run multiple instances, because let's say, um, I mean, it's all about, it, it will basically just be a race condition in the end, like who's going to come first, like, and then if, if it's distributed in multiple regions, we're moving into the distributed, like, eventual consistency space of things and stuff like that. That's not a thing we sort of been at yet, uh, but, but probably something we will need to, to think about at one point. There was a question. Yeah. <laughs> so if you run one um, instance at a time, are, are you moving that instance to be near the the requester, or is it just in, or wh where is it geographically located? So um, I mean, I can speak to the implementation we've done for our cloud, which is currently our cloud is 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 not more than a, it's not even a year old yet. So in our in our cloud implementation, we just have a single region at this point, but but the the. But we are, we are starting to design a multi-region setup, right? And if you wanted to do that yourself, you also have to think about that as well. Um, the, the, um, where are we coming from? The huge benefit we get, because we use WebAssembly, is that if you think about what, what you need, there's a great talk that uh, an engineer from Lambda did, AWS Lambda did a while back, a, a reinvent talk about how one of the big problems with a thing like Lambda and and this is the concept of cold starts, right? That if you send a request and the Lambda function hasn't been used in a while, it can take some time before it replies. And that is basically a storage problem, like a logistical problem, right? Because you may have an, a function that you, dis you created or that you wrote that is a Python function that relies on a particular framework. Now, the, the, the job to be done is to get that function code to a host somewhere with all the dependencies that is needed for that thing to run, right? So, Request comes in, you need to find the thing, you need to find a host to put it on. That host has to be warm. If it's not warm, it comes up cold, and, you know, and then you handle that, and then you keep them up running. And there's a huge overhead in that, right? And you can start imagining how, depending on the programming language and the frameworks being used, it becomes a, it becomes a big combinatorial matrix of hosts supporting some things and other options here. Because these are WebAssembly. That combinatorial matrix for us just have like one field in it because it's a web assembly and we can run it on any architecture, any operating system, and we don't have any dependencies. So that logistical challenge of finding a machine that's hot, that can execute the web assembly and handle that request, and the web assembly is just like, we can use, we only need one pool of machines basically, right? So, so again, if you think about this in context of a Kubernetes cluster, for instance, uh, a lot of cloud providers use concepts of node pools where these nodes either have, you know, um, 
different operating systems or different architectures and those. Things. Again, these, these, you start creating that combinatorial matrix where you need to handle the logistics of all these things. And by the fact that this is WebAssembly, that, that problem goes away. So, so that's, a, that's one of the big benefits in what we can do here, right? Okay? Yeah? So by the way, get started with the workshop. Like, time is, you know, there's a lot of questions. So just, just go ahead if you want to do one. I'll... One question about uh, how much time take, it takes to create the virtual machine. So does the virtual machine oh, yeah. pre provision or, or just on time? Um, I don't have the exact, mm, well, so the, the I mean, it's, a, it's a, if you use a, uh, a runtime like Wasm time to do this, it's yeah. basically just, a, it, it's a few milliseconds to start that virtual machine up, okay. right? Okay. So the way that you would run a WebAssembly is you will call the runtime and then pass in the, the WebAssembly file that is actually being, okay. being, being loaded to run. So, so they also only exist for the time that the WebAssembly is running and then that's okay. all tear, torn down. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm working on uh, automotive industry in Japan. So in automotive uh, hardware is very limitation, uh, DTR size or storage size. So what do you think uh, this solution impact memory and storage? If, if it's applicable to that scenario? Yeah. What, yeah. I, th I think it was in con actually Bosch a mobility solution, so BUS, the German auto provider, they actually showcase how they're starting using WebAssembly inside of some of their solutions for in-car. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've previous experience working with BUS as well, where they were trying to do these things. So one of the problems they have is like, you know, a lot of spread out GPUs in those cars and they really can't talk to each other and how do they utilize all the processing power best. And they were trying to do these things with containers but it was just a too heavy of a workload. And, and really, from what I saw back then and, and with WebAssembly today, I think this is the solution that would be needed in there because again, you have the security, you have the small size, mm -hmm. you have the startup time, you have the portability, which means that if you have like various processors being added to your car that you go and source from somewhere, you can actually run the same application across all of these because the architecture doesn't matter. So yeah, I think it's highly applicable in those scenarios to look at. Okay, cool. I'll start showing some spin stuff up here and then, you know, more questions. We have a booth up here as well. We'll be here for the rest of the day and tomorrow. So come by and have conversations. Um, we also have a Discord uh, channel where we're more than happy to welcome all of you. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's switch over to the workshop. Um, this, is the, um, this is the GitHub repository we have and you can see there's a bunch of things that we need to get done in here. So, as we do this, I will probably see if I can do like a side-by-side -side screen up here as, as I go along, because that will help me <laughs> see what I need to do. Uh, and you can probably see in the terminal uh, what is going on. Well, are we okay on the font size up here? For everyone also in the back? Yeah, good, okay. So, uh, I mean, I've already cloned the repository, so I have everything down here. One thing to know about this repository is that um, it's structured in a way where, okay, that wasn't, that wasn't easy to see. Let me actually do that over here. It's just, it's, it's structured in a way where you have um, underneath the directory spin, you have all the articles uh, describing the steps of the workshop. Um, and along the way, we need to build a set of applications, right? The workshop is created in a way so you can, there are code samples to do this in Rust and there are code samples to do this in uh, TypeScript. So you can choose either of those. Um, you can also do your own adventure and try to do this in Python if you want to, but we don't have the code samples. Um, for shortcutting, all the apps have already been written. So there's a directory called apps where you can see the actual implementation of the individual steps as, as we go along. So, so if you need to, um, you, can, you can do that as well. Okay, so the first thing we need to, done to, uh, to get set up is to have an environment where we can actually run spin. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the repository, we provide a few options. You can configure your local environment. All that requires for you is to download spin the binary, a few templates and plugins with spin, uh, and then have the tool chain for the programming language you want to use. So if you want to use Rust, you need the Rust compiler, and you need to be able to compile to WebAssembly from Rust if you're going to do uh, JavaScript, TypeScript. I think the only thing you need is actually NPM. Um, 
and then you're good to go beyond spin. And it's not like I want to, but I can't help sometimes calling out Docker experiences a little bit. Like it, 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 is, it, is a, it is a different type of developer experience here, but there's a lot of the same benefits you'll eventually get from this. Um, so you can install all of that locally. We also provided a development container. So if you use Visual Studio Code and you use Docker, because Docker is still <laughs> really, really useful in those scenarios, you, we've created a, a container with all the requirements installed in it. And you can also run that container on GitHub code spaces if you wanted to. I am going to go ahead just using my local environment because that is already set up. Um, so we have homebrew to install spin. I already did that. And basically, if we take a look, we can see that I'm on spin 1.5. So I have spin installed. There's a few other things that the installer does for us. So spin has uh, two concepts that I think are interesting to um, to, to know is that there's a concept of templates, which is basically how you bootstrap an application. And there is a, there is a, um, uh, let me do that. There is a, um, so, so there is, there's a way where you can provide your own templates. It's a fairly easy thing. And if you go to spin up, you can see some of those things in there are actually provided as templates. Um, the templates are components in an application. I'll explain in, in a bit what that means. But you can see there's a bunch of uh, templates that comes with the installer, and you can see where they where they originate from. A lot of these comes from the main spin repo. Some comes from the SDK repos, like the JavaScript and the Python ones. And then you have something like a key value explorer. We'll get to that later, and a QR generator. So basically, those are already compiled WebAssembly that you can just add to your application. So there's a there's this notion of composing applications you can do as well. The other one uh, is the plugins. So Spin has a concept of plugins that will just enhance the developer experience. And you can see there's a bunch of plugins that have been installed already. Um, Python to WebAssembly compilation, JavaScript to WebAssembly compilation, those are basically things that we have uh, created uh, to help uh, get from your programming language to WebAssembly. There's some Kubernetes uh, plugins and other plugins that I've installed with my spin. And again, it's very easy for you to write plugins for spin if you want to extend with more triggers and those type of things. That's a thing you can do. Okay, now that we have spin, I'm pretty sure that the next thing we need to do, that was actually part one of the workshop. Okay, <laughs> well, that was part zero. Let's get to part one. Okay, so the, one, the thing that we want to do is get started with this Magic 8-Ball application, right? I'm probably, I'm going to go ahead with the Rust thing up here because it's been a while since I've done the JavaScript. So let's, let's see if this can work. Um, so what we will do to begin with is we'll use one of these templates to bootstrap the application. So we'll do the spin new command. We'll pick the template called HTTP Rust. And basically, there's a, um, um, what do you say? We usually name these templates with trigger dash programming language. No, sorry. Yeah, trigger dash programming language. So it's sort of easy to remember. Like, this is an HTTP based trigger. It's using Rust. Uh, we can call this a little Rust. Um, and we can, we can do a, you know, accept defaults, usually. The templates can ask a few questions of, you know, do you want to put in a description and so on and so forth. Um, but we don't have to do here. Um, I already had that. Actually, let me do something. Let me, let me just do a directory and let's go over there. And let me go back, create it in there. Okay, I can now go into the directory that was created. And you can see what we get in here is we get a spin.toml file and we get some Rust source code. Let's start out with that spin.toml file just to understand the, the anatomy of these type of applications. So the toml is a manifest that we create for every spin application or that you have to create for a spin application. Um, the first six lines is just a little bit of metadata around the application. So you can you know, define versions, orders, descriptions, um, the type of triggers. Today, we only support a single trigger type uh, per application. Uh, but definitely, we want to be able to, to mix trigger types in applications. And then the next thing, starting line eight, as you can see, there's going to be a, uh, there, there's room for a table of array of components down here. So the anatomy of these applications are basically, you can have these multiple components that make up your application. And what you notice is that part of the trigger definition here in line 13 is that there's a certain route within the HTTP structure that this component handles. So basically what we've defined for this component is that if, a, if an HTTP request hits on the the root of, you know, this is going to be localhost if we run this locally. 
the WebAssembly that we want to handle that request is defined in line 10 as the source, so that is going to be a WebAssembly that we compile. So you can easily imagine how another component can handle another route, which is another WebAssembly handling that route. So that's sort of how the anatomy of these applications work, and you can start spreading out the various functions between various WebAssembly. And again, what's really interesting here is that from line 13 and 10, none of these say anything about the programming language that are being used, right? Because it's just the WebAssembly handling that request. We only know from the build section down here that this is built using Kakos, which, which is an indication to us that this is actually a Rust application. So if you take a look at the, act, the, the code in here, a few things to notice. Uh, if you don't understand, if you don't understand, if you don't know Rust code, it should be fairly easy to, to, to follow along. I'll, I'll do my best to explain as we go along. A few using statement or imports at the beginning, where you can see there's an SDK that we uh, use from Spin. And then we have a macro definition down here, which say this is, the, this is the function that is implementing this component. What that means is we've told the host runtime that when the trigger triggers, the HTTP request is going to be handed over to this function. So I can basically add other functions that I need in here that you know, would be functions internal to my logic. But the one that I annotate with that macro is the one that's being handed over the request. So you can see in line 9 how this function uh, takes a request and um, sends back a response. And basically what we're doing here is we're just going to say OK uh, with a header and some body in. And we'll print, print a line out to the console uh, with the request headers that were actually involved in that request. OK, so now we have that. The next thing we need to do is we run a spin build command. Basically, the spin build command hooks into that toml file, right, where you can see the word set of cargo commands defined. So that's sort of how we build a common experience around, you know, if, if I had Rust code and Python and JavaScript in all in one application, each individual component had it, basically had its own build command, right, that I could define in there. So it's just a, it's just a bash command that we, we call out to. So now my web application is compiled, and I can run spin up. So now I have my application listening. So if we go down here and we try to curl whoa, um, into that localhost 3000. Oh, 300. There you go. Oh. What did I do wrong? Oh, thank you. I don't have my glasses on. That's why. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hello, Fermion. OK, so what happened? Well, when we curled the host process that we have running up here, actually, the way that this works is the host process starts up a child process that, that is the, you know, the virtual machine and the sandboxed component instantiation. So the host process is listening on the port, which means the host is the one that's actually had the web server implementation, because that's what we need here. So it, it hits that host process. It looks up in the spin.toml. Where, where, which route matches the request, which means what WebAssembly do I have to hand this request over to? The WebAssembly is loaded, the function is handled, the response is returned, and we get the response back here. So that's just a few lines of code to get started with these types uh, of applications. Um, oh, okay. I guess the next, the next step in the workshop is now we, we want to change things. So let's go into this one and say, uh, I guess, Bilbao. <laughs> That's the only thing I can think of when I do this thing is like, what city are we in? Okay, let's do Bilbao. Okay, hello Bilbao, we'll go and save that. I do another spin build. Um, I did the spin build up there. I can do a spin up up here and I can go back and hello Bilbao. OK, so that's pretty straightforward, right? There's, a, there's an easy way to us, for us to iterate on this. We actually have a command in spin that is called spin watch. And what, what watch will do is a regular watch command, which means that if I go and change something in the source code, um, I don't know why, but I'm moving around. Let's just add another exclamation mark in here. You can see that the build was triggered. So now if I curl again, we have the updated Already right. So spin watch is just again from the developer experience point of view, you know, it's fairly easy to get going here. Spin new, pick your template, start writing your function code, add the spin watch, and you just start iterating. Cool. 
And actually, it's the same with, with TypeScript. So if you go through the, the tutorial here on the left-hand side, we'll do the same. We create a new spin application. We build that with spin build. We use spin up. That was a bonus feature on spin watch. And we modified the HTTP trigger. Oh, we didn't modify the route. But I think I talked about that, right? How in the spin.toml we could define the routes and how all of that worked. All right, so let's go ahead with that magic eight ball. So what we're going to implement now is instead of just returning some text in the body, we're actually going to implement a real JSON API um, where we can return uh, one of these four answers, asking in later, absolutely, unlikely, simply put no, um, and they will be randomly selected. OK. So we can go over here and, you know what, I am actually just going to, um, I'm going to go and just show the app because I think that would make as much sense instead of you having to uh, just see me um, copy pasting code over here. <laughs> so again, this is the finished app that this section will lead you through. Uh, the spin.toml is the same, right? So the structure is all the same. The only thing we, 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 we changed in here is that we actually have a designated route for our API, which means that any HTTP request that comes into slash magic eight ball will be handled by this WebAssembly. Um, the code implemented, again, we're using the same imports from the SDK. We have annotated the handler magic eight ball function up here with that macro, meaning this is where the request goes. Uh, we format an answer in JSON um, based on calling the answer function, and we just return that in an OK um, HTTP response. And then we implement another function down here, right? So you can see how you're free to implement any type of function and structures you want in these, in these small uh, uh, libraries in here. And basically, this, this answer will just return a string. There are a set of possible answers that you can uh, return. And basically, there's a function here to randomly pick an answer. And that's, that's it, right? So, so you know, beyond having that HTTP component annotated function as the handler, whatever you want to do with that HTTP request, you can, you can, you can do that in here. Um, again, the commands to get this going. Actually, let's just look at that build command in here for a second. Um, so there is this component build section as well, right? Where this is the command. Whenever I run spin build, it actually just runs cargo build. You can say, see that the, the target definition for cargo is to produce a WASI compatible WebAssembly, um, which is what we want to do here. And then you can see there's also this for the watch function, if I want to iterate and just have a watch running, uh, I'm able to define, you know, an array of blobs to be under the watch. So, you know, if any of the files matching this, uh, the blob statements in here uh, would change, we will go and rebuild the application simply. So again, we can do a, actually let's do a build, a spin watch, sorry. Uh, spin watch will always build and then uh, whoa, wow, this is nice. So something going on here. Fail to select the version for anyhow. Okay. What do we have in here? Anyhow one. Matt, can I get some help? <laughs> I know. Uh, what is this? This is crates IO, right? Let's check. Anyhow, what's going on here? Do we need to be more specific? Let's do that. Let's be more specific and see what happens. Let's try spin build. No. Phase of efficient for any kind of Oh. Do we have something not updated here? Oh, I know what. There is a. Can I ask you to open the GitHub issue? <laughs> we did not update the SDK references in here. Let me go ahead and do that. Actually, let me go and revert this. Uh, with 152? 142? Uh, but did you, okay, did you use the pre-built? Uh, 
so we're still back to fail to select the version for anyhow required by with by gen spin. Okay. Mm. I think it said didn't it said point seven. Uh, oh. Uh, 1.75, let's just try and do the latest and see if that will help. Yes. Okay. So this is, this is just like, you know, uh, I think the, the, the learning, the demonstration we got to do is that like, this is just Rust development, right? Like what we were dealing with here. There's nothing here that you know, from coming from the programming language that you use that until we get to the compile time that, that actually sort of impacts you by the fact that you want to do WebAssembly. That's not all true because there's stuff you can't do in WebAssembly today on Wasi today, but, but you know, just from a sort of general perspective, this is, this is just developing functions in that programming language that you, that you use. All right, spin up, we have the magic eight ball, let's shortcut that, and oh, we should have asked the question. I forgot that. What's the question that we can drag in? Should we build more spin applications? Ask again later. Okay. Should we build more spin applications? Absolutely. There you go. Okay. Could have been better. Okay. Cool. Um, so again, if you go through this on your own, you sort of step through this, and you can get to get a feel of how the how the actual um, how the actual code works. So basically, you can see how you know. Creating a JSON API, and I, hopefully you noticed in the, in the browser window that my browser, where I have an extension to pass JSON, that this is, this is truly JSON coming back. Um, I'm glad we didn't do unlikely, by the way. Okay, that was, that was the second part of it. Um, the AI one, I think I probably just want to walk through this, uh, looking at some of the code in here. Um, so the big, the big change with this AI, this is actually the first time we're starting introducing something from the SDK that is not necessarily just, you know, doing HTTP requests and responses. Um, so we have this interface called LLM to do uh, large language model inferencing based on using Llama 2 chat or Llama code. So what we would need to do instead of just having a, a fixed set of uh, replies, we can do some prompt engineering here and we can start, you know, creating a context prompt. Actually, isn't that what you call them? That's what I would call it anyways, but I think there's probably a different word for that. But there's a context prompt that we provide to the large language model, you know, sort of setting the theme that you're now this magic eight ball and you have to reply and so on and so forth. But what's, what's I think what we believe is, is really powerful in this model, and again, this comes back to our, you know, core enthusiasm uh, for developer experiences and all of that is within this, SDK, all I have to do to run an inferencing uh, request is basically define my model and call that the infer operation, passing in the model, passing in my prompt, and I'll get an answer back. I'll basically get uh, a, a, a prompt back from that. And, um, and anything in terms of hosting those LLM models, getting access to the GPUs and all of that setup is all taken care off for you. So you can see how, you know, going from a static set of, of answers in this type of application into having something that is way more dynamic is actually pretty, pretty simple. Uh, let me go into this one here. Uh, oops, sorry. I'm just going to stay on the Rust route. I just want to see. Um, sorry, that's not what I wanted to see. What happened? Let me go back. Um, yeah, so you can see we have the application in here. We're going to check if we get a question, uh, an answer back or not. We're going to use that Llama 2 chat. I want to say for the inferencing call down here, uh, when, you, when you do these type of inferencing calls, there's a lot of parameters you can, you can turn, like in terms of temperature and stuff like that, like, you know, how precise do you want the answers to be and so on and so forth. So we are able to pass, use another function, which is actually infer with options, so we can sort of fine tune those things. Um, I think the one thing that I just want to show you is how this will actually work uh, once you get it into an infrastructure where you have that inferencing piece set up. What I'm doing down here is I'm using another command in spin called deploy that is attached to a plugin we created for our cloud 
So what that does is it basically takes this application, packages it up as an OCI package, deploys it into our cloud, and in a few seconds, this application should be available. And if we are really lucky, you can see the application is already up and running. So again, talking about that operations model and everything, I mean, it literally took us 21 seconds to deploy this whole application and it is ready to reply. I think what I need now is to have a way to create that question. Let me see if there's a curl command. Okay. Oh, so we can basically say, just pass in the data. So what should the question be? Should we visit the Guggenheim Museum later today? Let's see if I can get that right. Let's add that, ask that question, and I just need to get the URL right. Yes, it's a must-see attraction. So we are actually, with, with the few lines of code you have in here, you now have a, an API that you built with some prompt engineering that is a real magic LLM-based eight ball that can easily answer to these type of questions. And again, I want to call out the one second execution time. I have a small batch timer here, approximately one second, to actually go through that whole flow of getting the ACP request to the cloud, calling the inferencing model, which actually right now is a set of GPUs in a totally different data center, <laughs> actually across, across an ocean, <laughs> have the LLM model run that inferencing and get the request, uh, sorry, get the reply back to me. Like, this is actually a really cool demo. I haven't done this particular demo before, so I'm a little bit excited right now. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> and by the way, even though I'm not an, a Magic 8-Ball, I went to the Guggenheim Museum yesterday, and I completely agree with the Magic 8-Ball. It is a must-see attraction. You should go and visit. Okay. Um, so that was a little bit of AI, which, which you know, from the whole spin model, uh, it's just an, another thing you can do with your applications right now. The next part of the, the tutorial uh, helps you, because these applications are great, you know, and APIs, but if we actually want to build something that is a real web application and we want a front end, how do we do that? So if you think about how I talked the, about the spin model and the, that spin toml file, it's actually very easy for me to add another component that I want to have to deal with the whole front end. And What's interesting about these uh, component references is that it doesn't have to reference a WebAssembly that I have available locally in my machine. So you can see in the code sample that is here is that the component that I want to use is actually a remote component that we get uh, from GitHub, from a URL. So we build this thing we call the static file server, which is basically a WebAssembly component that takes files that are available within that, uh, to that WebAssembly and, you know, serializes them into a set of binary stuff that, you know, bytes that we can send back to the client that can then, you know, get an index HTML, some JavaScript, whatever we want to serve with that static file, so we can get that, uh, we can get that out there. So, so what you, all you have to do is, because of the templating system again, we can do a spin add command, and we can add the static file server, and we can call it file server. So the template is set up in a way it's going to ask us a few questions. And the first thing is like, what, uh, which, which path do you want to have the file server serve? And we actually want to have the file server serve the root. So if you go to a browser, you don't have to do slash something. It's just the root. And then we can map, you know, what directory locally here when I build my application, the files that I want to have the file server serve where they should, where they're located. And in this case, we're going to tell them that we'll have a directory called assets. So if we look at the toml file now, you can see there's another component being added. So right now we have two components in here. We have the original 8-ball API, and we now have a static file server that is just a WebAssembly that I didn't build, someone else, someone from Fermion built, and I trust that, and there is some digest in here to make sure it's the right thing we get and we run. And you can see how the route and the files are actually being set up here. Um, so the, the only thing we have to do is then just, you know, get whatever static content we want to serve, get that into that asset folder. And I think that 
that should be here somewhere. Let me just do a little bit of digging around and I think we should be able to find it. There is the front end. Uh, so if we go to our, back to our AI Rust and then we can, we should be able to copy that into assets. Isn't that what we called it? Assets? I think that's what we call it. And if we do that recursively, we should get all the files. Let's just see what ended up in there. Okay, so you can see now we copied an index HTML, some style and an icon into the asset folder. Assets folder. <laughs> so if I do a spin up, you can see that we actually now have these two components being served, right? So there's still the API being served on Magic 8, but we also have the file server listening here. And we can see that we now have a front end. So that's just the index uh, HTML. So, so we can try another question for this Magic 8 ball. Does anyone have a good question that we want to ask? Yeah? OK, I'm blanking right now. Something about food. Something about food. Um, should I go to a fancy restaurant? Tonight. Um, tonight, or just do a simple take out and eat in my hotel room. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Let's spin that one. And did we get a reply back? Oh, we're running this locally. That's absolutely not what I want to do. I want to deploy this to the cloud. Just hold on a second because I need that LLM uh, feature. So, well, at least we know the front end work now, and I'm deploying that into the cloud, and then I have all the inferencing ready for me. So last time, this was the 21 second deployment. Let's see how quick it goes now. Might take a little bit longer because there are a few files we need to upload. Okay. Okay, so now we have the application in the cloud. Okay. <laughs> Should I eat fancy tonight? <laughs> Let's just do this a little bit more simple. <laughs> and your taste buds decide. Okay, that's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that answer, actually. <laughs> uh, but anyways, so we actually, we, we, we now with fairly small amount of code, we have a fully AI-backed or generative AI-backed application that is a magic eight ball that can help us make decisions in our life. Just don't make any like important decision based on this. That's a disclaimer I want to say. <laughs> um, but again, what this, what this particular section showed you is how this idea of composing applications based on different components uh, will, works in SPIN. We have this static file server that's good for web, um, web content, front ends, and how these individual components can actually call each other. Um, well, Kind of not, I would say that's a, that's a stretch here because basically it's my client calling the API, but actually you can have multiple components that sort of can call each other, so you can chain calls that way. One of the, um, one of the recent examples one of our colleagues built uh, was basically an OAuth component. So if you want to build a web application and you want to do some OAuth integration, you can just take that component that uh, Rajat built, add it to your application, and now you have an OAuth, functional, OAuth functionality. So, so, so there is, there is, there is, there is a vision here around this whole component thing that I talk about. Where in in Spin you can sort of see, you know, the the outline for how at a given point in time, you know, this idea of composing applications of pre-built components is actually a thing you can do. What we're doing in Spin right now is a model that works just with Spin. Uh, but it is, it is inspired by and sort of spearheading a little bit a specification in the WebAssembly uh, community, which is called the WebAssembly component model. Um, we actually do support that in SPIN right now, but the component model in itself and the implementations of the component model in particular, component model in particular in Watson time, which is the runtime that we use, is not far enough ahead so we can actually use it. But what that means is that there will be a standard specification for how you can build these web assemblies as components that would define a set of imports and exports. So you can have a web assembly component that would, in the case of 
it being a spin component, it would import something called WASI HTTP, which again is a set of defined interfaces that anyone can go and implement, which means that that particular component can run in any host, not just a spin host, that supports WASI HTTP. Um, and you can, you, can, you can think about it in a way where, you know, the same way that you use libraries to import functionality within your programming language, you can actually do that on the WebAssembly layer, which means that you can have a particular function implemented in one programming language, but you can actually reuse that function by importing it from other programming languages because it all work at the WebAssembly layer. So there's a lot of work still to be done to sort of get that, get that wrapped and make it usable. In particular, you need to bridge between all the tool chains and programming languages and down to the WebAssembly layer and understand the types and all of that. Um, but I think the, 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 the longer term vision is how, you know, the same way here that we just pulled in a file server that someone else wrote and made it part of our application. That way of composing application is something that, that you can do with that component model in the future. Cool. So that was the, um, that was the file server part of it. Now we want to make this even smarter and we want to be able to actually store the responses that we have between requests. So remember how I, know, how I mentioned that each individual request, like there's nothing we can persist between our requests. There's no shared memory, there's no sort of concept as a session that you sometimes know from web servers um, or that you would know from web servers normally. Um, so, so having a key value store is really, really valuable for a lot of scenarios. The key value store that we've implemented in SPIN, the interface is, um, is, is pretty straightforward. I can show you here, developerfermin.com is where we keep all the documentation uh, for SPIN. So if we look at, I think we should be able to check out the key value store down here. Um, you can see the setup operations that we have for this interface is, you open a store, you can get a value, you can set a value, you can get the value by providing a key. You can set a value by providing a key. You can delete. It does it exist? Get all keys, and you can eventually close. So fairly simple API, very similar to how you would use something like Redis. Um, and when I use that locally in my machine right now, this is all backed by a file-based SQLite. So that's all just set up for you. Um, when you deploy this into an infrastructure, like in our cloud, we use some vendors database behind the scene to persist this with. Uh, but we do have a, I think it may or may not be described in here. Um, but there is actually a way where you can implement uh, using Redis as the backend store uh, instead of just using the SQLite. So if you have a setup where you want to persist this in a Redis uh, database instead, you can do that, but it's the same API you would use from inside your code. Um, Okay, so let's see how far did we get. So what we want to do is we want to store the questions and answers. So again, this is basically kind of a caching mechanism that we can add to this. Uh, let me see how, is this 05 and Rust? Let me just see how much we have in here. Yeah, we have the front end and all that. That's nice, okay. Um, So we can go back and we can start take a little bit look at the code. So this is this is actually not AI enabled anymore, which is a shame, but that's okay. Uh, but there's another function that is now being implemented here, which is where we'll go and check whether we have things in the cache. And again, the API is pretty straightforward. Like you open the store, there's this. Um, I used to refer to it as a convenience feature. <laughs> I can basically say open default, and it really it, it ties into. Um, the local developer experience where within the component, what I defined here in line 19 is what key value stores this particular component will have access to. So remember in the beginning, I talked about this capability-based access model that WebAssembly used that we've adopted here as well. And that means that even though that all these components live inside the same application and would be deployed inside of the same application, you have to specifically define what resources each component would have access to. So in this case, the file server component 
running in its own little sandbox, will never be able to access that key value store because it's not defined in here that it has access. Okay? Um, so I can actually add multiple key value stores per component, and multiple components can have access to the same stores, right? But they have to specifically get that access uh, by, by, def uh, by defining it in here. Uh, going back to that magic word default, the way that that works um, locally in spin is that we, we just create that SQL uh, light database for you and we store it there. Um, we also have that feature supported in, 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 the, in the cloud, but, but the way that the whole thing works is that you can, you can pre, predefine these key value stores and make them available in your infrastructure and then you know the component have to tell which key value store specifically by name it wants to use. There's actually in line, in line 20, there's another concept of the capability-based security model, which is that if a, if a spin component wants to talk to an HTTP host, again, you have to specifically define the host that the component is allowed to talk to. Um, and I think what I like about this, this file, and this is something that we always come back to when we enable new features, is actually the same thing with the AI uh, feature that I showed. You have to define in here what AI models which are the LLM models the, the component would, would get access to. Um, but what I like about this is that if you, if you just want to run a spin application, which you potentially haven't developed, right, by looking at this file, you can actually see the various capabilities that each component would require and whether you can fulfill those uh, or how you would fulfill those, right? So it sort of gives a great overview of what's, what's going on and what's required from this particular application. Uh, I think I have the other thing open here. Yeah. So, so the open default call just basically takes that open, um, uh, takes that default implementation and uses it. Then we check whether by running the um, calling the get function, whether the particular question actually exists in the store or not. We're using a match statement here in Rust, so we can get an OK or we can get an error back. If it's actually there, we'll just go and uh, let's see. Yeah, we actually get the answer in there. What do I have from the, oh, that's the value. Yeah, if we get a value back, we get the answer. We put that into the answer variable. If the answer is ask again later, um, I guess that's a thing in this logic of the code. <laughs> we can put that, we can put the question and answer back into the store. Uh, if not, we can, just, we can just provide the answer. So basically, I guess the logic here is a little bit clever. So if my magic eight ball would say ask again later, it won't keep saying ask again later. <laughs> like it will actually invalidate that from the cache, which is fairly advanced magic eight ball logic, caching logic going on here. <laughs> um, if we don't find it, um, we'll just arrow back, but we'll still set the question and answer that is being provided so we now have that cached. And that's it. Like 20 lines of Rust code here, and we have a advanced magic eight ball answering mechanism with built-in invalidation for the case of ask again later. Okay, so again, we can build this application. Building is going great right now. We fixed the anyhow thingy. <laughs> um, spin up the application, go to the file server. Um, what food should I eat? Should I eat food? I guess that's what we can. Should I eat food after this? Let's see. Ask again. Oh, ask again later. That's good. So we shouldn't get an ask again later now unless we hit the logic that the new reply is going to be asked again. No, absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Which means that every time we ask the same question now, we will also always get absolutely. Okay, so now we have that caching mechanism. And just to you know, make this real, real, um, there is a dot spin directory in this application, which is sort of like a working directory. What you'll notice in here is that not only do we uh, store the logs, like whatever console logs is being written, standard out, standard error, uh, but you can see, you can actually see the SQLite file that we have down here, where, we okay with the audio thing? Yeah, okay, where the, there's a real SQLite relational database, and then there's the key value implementation. And I think we can do something like, uh, if we look at the SQLite key, oh, there's a dump feature, right? Isn't that dot dump? 
Oh, it's a dump. I need to do that, and then I can do... Just a second, let me see. I, I did this once. It's just interesting to see. So, SQL light. Oh, there you go. This one, that's the one I want. So, basically, now I'm just going to dump whatever is in that database to a local SQL file. And it's just to show you, like, the implementation of this. So, key value. And if we... Oop, take a look at that file you basically see what we added like we just have a simple table it has a store name it has a key that's a text field and then value is just going to be passed into a blob right so that's how we've implemented <laughs> well not implement that's how we implemented a key value store in a relational database anyways that was a bonus bonus feature <laughs> uh, cool yeah so key value store simple api 20 lines of advanced caching logic being written down here. Um, well, I already sk skipped this a little bit of head here because this is talking about how we can deploy thing into the cloud. And I showed you that with the AI example. Um, I think the thing I can add a little bit more on here is that, I mean, beyond being able to deploy this, there is a, there is a UI where you can get to and you can see these, see these application. Um, so if you look at the magic eight ball, should be able to see, you know, we have some requests that we received early on, and we actually didn't provide any logs here, but if we have logs. So there's a little bit of a UI here to make it easy for you to, to see what's going on, what's going on in there. Um, yeah. Again, the feature of our cloud is you can attach your own domain, you can bring your own domain, or you can try to get a good domain, so Magic 8-Ball, Probably someone already do Magic 8 Ball. Let's do Magic 8 Bilbao. I think that's the name we can do. So basically now we have that application on Magic 8 Bilbao Fermion app. We're updating it. We can check back a little bit later and that should be should be fixed. I'm actually not sure if the, if the UI knows. Oh, we even validated the link. That's a That's an interesting feature. There you go. So now we have a Magic 8 Ball, Magic 8 Bilbao from your app. Okay, cool. Nice feature of the cloud. Um, again, it's an open beta our cloud or private. No, open beta. Uh, so basically, you can just come and sign up and try this out. Um, you get five apps and a ton of requests and a single SQL database and some key value store and some ML M LLM feature, all of that for free. Um, so it's great. It's great to get started with. Um, so this next check section of the tutorial <clears throat> uh, shows you how you can take that key value implementation that I showed where we use a local SQLite file and, and use, use Redis instead. I think what I'm doing is just going to... Uh, we can basically talk through this with the, with the documentation that we have up here. Um, so let me go a little bit down. So basically, once we have... Once we have our Redis set up, um, the way that we provide this configuration into into a spin is 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 through the spin.toml where we can we can we can set up an, an environment variable or we can set up a variable in there. Actually, let me check if the code is over here. That might be better. Uh, what's this? No, we don't have that for seven. Okay. Um, Let me check. No, this is actually using Redis directly. That's not the one I want to use. Let me check over here. So in, in the spin SDK, like we, 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 we talk a lot about the key value interface and the SQL interface, but there are actually, there are other APIs that we have that you can talk directly with Redis or with things like Postgres that we build. It's, it's, I don't know how much we want to keep doing that because part of this whole component model work that I talked about earlier on uh, part of that is also defining a set of standardized interfaces to talk to these type of things. And I think, um, let me go over here and see if I can find WASI HTTP, for instance. Um, yeah. Um, 
that's not the one. Uh, was he? Cloud Core, that's the one I want. Okay, so under the WebAssembly repo, one of the standards that has been worked up in something called WASI Cloud Core. So this is something that we're working on together with primarily Microsoft. And um, the idea with this WASI Cloud Core is sort of the, the whole framework that I've been talking, you've seen with Spin, where you, know, you, you write these functions type of based, functions handlers, basically, and interact with various things like key value stores or messaging or uh, you know, blob store, use HTTP and so on and so forth, can be described in this interface that is called WASI Cloud Core. That's the idea behind this project, right? So that's a, that's a, that's a shared specification um, where, where a set of other specifications are contained. So <laughs> in, in, in the WebAssembly component model, this specification, you, we, work, we have this concept called WIT, which is a WebAssembly interface type definition, right? So that's basically a, a language that can, uh, where you define the type of interfaces that your components either implements or requires. So it's, it's, it's basically a language. But what you can do with those WIT files, it's basically a file defining that, is that when you combine them into, you know, the combination of multiple WIT files, we call them worlds, right? So you can, you can think of this as there is, a, there is a WASI cloud core world, which is basically the combination of all those interface definitions being available. And the reason why this terminology, I think, works really, really well is if you think about this in terms of responsibilities, then in, this, in the spin model, as an analogy, the spin host would play the role of being responsible of providing the WASI cloud core world, right? So we can say, here's an implementation that's called spin. This implementation provides that particular world then if you go and write an application as a developer, then your responsibility is to define the world within your application, that, that your application wants to, you know, sort of be hosted within. So if you choose to take a dependency on things that are not part of this cloud core world, like you need to find another hosting provider or someone who provides a world that is a match for how you implement things. So, so that, and I think, you know, a little bit higher level for me, that, that, that is really around how a lot of people today have, you know, an interface between operations and developers, which is, it's either containers, like that's probably the most predominant one. Like if you as a developer or anything, if you bring me a container, then as a platform provider, as a host or as an operations department, I can run that, right? That's sort of the contract that is there today. Either that or you do something that is probably fairly proprietary to a cloud provider. The idea here is to sort of being able to actually lift that interface like up a few levels and say it's not, it's not, it's not a POSIX thing like a container would be, but it's a cloud core world, for instance. So you can build that platform and implement all of these things and say, now I have this world available. So if you build your applications matching that world, I would be an option for you to be hosted in. So that's the idea with, 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 with how, these things, um, how these things are being defined. And if you look at the key value interface definition, that is uh, pretty close to what we have in, um, um, what we have, what we've implemented in SPIN today is sort of like spearheading and trying this and getting some real world experience with this where, you know, I guess this is a, I guess this is a Rust example as well. Uh, so you can see the wit bind gen thing in the top is basically just, you know, is saying that this thing is, is, is implementing that world about outbound key value. But if you look down at the APIs, you can see there is an, an open bucket that's similar to how we did open in our command. Like you can set, you can check if thing exists, uh, and you can you can get something is there well right so so there would be a standardized a, standardized API around this that if you wrote this particular code the idea is that you can take that code and actually run that in a spin host or as a component in a spin application 
and hopefully, as others would adopt this, you could potentially take that and run it as you know your favorite cloud provider or in a Kubernetes cluster or whatever, the same code. But it's a fairly high-level defined set of APIs there. Um, and then going back to that responsibility thing, and that's the model you see in Spin today, then what's the actual database you know, resolving this underneath is really up to an internal implementation of that host provider. Where in Spin locally, it's a SQLite. If you run in Fermion Cloud, we have a, another database. And again, with Spin, you can then set it up to just use Redis as that implementation as well. Cool. All right. I totally detoured there, so I have no idea where we came from. So I need to go back in the browser to see where we were. I think we were talking about Redis, right? Uh, we were. OK, yeah. That was a long talk about storing key value data in an external database, but also a little bit of a look into the future of uh, WebSMD component model. And we're really excited about that. Um, in the world of, of WebSMD system interface, there's a preview two definition that we hope will get done soon because that will enable us to do sort of a first implementation of this. Uh, we actually do have some example implementations. So if you lurk around in the branches of the SPIN project, you might see some implementation there already. Uh, but give us a few months ish. <laughs> Maybe just one month. I don't know. Um, and I think we'll, we'll be there. OK. Are you guys up for some Kubernetes stuff? Because that's where we're at in the workshop right now. There is an example in here. And I, I, if, if you're really interested in this, and this is something that is useful for you, I definitely highly recommend that you go back and you try out this part of the workshop on your own. Like you can always do that. It basically walks you through how to use a K3D cluster to take the Magic 8-Ball application that we built, ran locally or ran in the Fermion Cloud, and package it up and just run it in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, again, this is, this is, I think the few things that I want to call out in here, instead of trying to walk through this, is um, through this, um, through the run WASI project. Let me just get it up here. Um, so in the container D project, um, I guess under the container D project, there's a repo called run WASI um, that facilitates running WebSMD or WASI workloads managed by container D, meaning you could run that in a Kubernetes cluster where you use container D. And they actually just did a new release. And I don't remember it, if they wrote anything in here. What I was trying to find out, I was trying to find the uh, various shims that exist. So you can see these are all WASM Edge, WASM Time, and WASM are all WebSMD runtimes. Those are, those are runtimes that are sort of agnostic to the programming model, which means that you can always build a WebAssembly that complies with the WASI interface that has a main function, right? And then just call that from the runtime. Like in the case of spin, we sort of wrap your component in a web server and yada, yada, yada. But that's all developer experience. But you can always just build a WebAssembly and run it directly through the through the through one of these runtime. So they don't they don't have that opinionated type of uh, application model and experience that Spin does have. Um, but those those exist as part of Run Wasi. And also Spin is in here. I just can't find a good reference to all of that. Is that because it's actually another repo? I'm not sure. Anyways. So, but once you have this, if you enable that in your Kubernetes cluster, and the way you would do that is basically you will, you will have to tell Kubernetes that there is now a new runtime class in the Kubernetes. In this case, we will enable WASM time spin v1, which means that with run WASI, that now understands how to pass a spin.toml file and understands that application definition based on the spin.toml file. And what's really, really interesting, and this is where, this is where comparisons with, uh, with containers become, become interesting, is to actually see the Docker file. Um, and hopefully we have that in here. Uh, let's go there. And we don't, but if I run, uh, I, can, I can generate the Docker file, and I really want to show that to you. 
if I do, let me see. Spin. I need to do spin build, and I need to do spin K8 scaffold. So there's another plugin we created to help set this up. You can also handcraft this, but there's a plugin called K8 for spin. Uh, don't mind the registry, um, but don't mind the failure. What I want to show you is the Docker file. There it is. <laughs> uh, if you're f familiar with Docker file, right? The idea of Docker files is you have all these files, system layers, and when you the first thing you do in a Docker file is always say, what, what layer do I want to, file system layer do I want to build this on? And if you remember all the way back around an hour and a half ago <laughs> when I talked about dependencies, anything, if you want to write, if you want to run a Python Flask API or something like that in a Docker container, you always would have a file system layer underneath your application, which is that framework and the set of dependencies required, right? So you need to build on top of that, which means that the container eventually, when you deploy it, it's like it's a big file system you need to move around. If you notice here in line one, we build from scratch. And again, scratch is a convenience magic word in the world of Docker. That means that there is no file system layers underneath. And then the, the few things that we do is that we copy in the spin.toml file and we copy in the WebAssembly files. And again, if you remember the other thing I said an hour and a half ago, the size of these things are really, really small. So basically, we will probably create a container here, which is something like 5 to 10 megabytes. And that's, that's a fully contained application and all that is needed. So if we build that Docker file and we have those runtimes enabled in our Kubernetes clusters, we can now deploy them as real containers inside of those Kubernetes clusters. So I think this, this, for me, this is where sort of all of those benefits of WebAssembly come together in a very straight comparison with what do we do with containers today and how, how these things can be made much, much more simple. Which, where Spin talks a lot about developer experience, I think this talks about how the operational experience of using server-side WebAssembly can be highly improved. Cool. Okay. Um, Okay, timing is actually really good. We have three minutes left. The last sort of like the bonus thing is if you want to see how the SQLite interface works in Spin, you can always do that. But actually what this is, is sort of like it's a lottery thing that was built. So the lottery here is like we can put in a, a bunch of contestants into a lottery and then we can go and pick a winner. Um, so what I did before you all entered the room is I... Um, let me see. I, I, I added, there's an API in here where I can add things. Very much. You can go look at the code later, that's really trivial. But I added each seat number into this lottery machine. And now when we're going to pick a winner, you can check your seat number if you're in that row, or if you're in a seat with that number who's going to be the winner, Matt will give you a t-shirt. And by the way, you can all get a t-shirt if you want. <laughs> I think we have enough t-shirts. But you know, just as a fun, Small thing in the end. Let's curl this and see. Seat 18, is anyone in seat 18? That would be 18. There is no one in seat 18. Anyways, you can go and get a t-shirt by Matt if you want. <laughs> he has a bunch of Fermion t-shirts here as well. Yeah, throw a shirt at seat 18. We can put it there and someone will. Oh, that was actually close. That was, that was 20. <laughs> um, anyways. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got some time to maybe play around with the tutorial, at least got some information from me walking through a lot of the tutorials. The workshops are out there. Feel free to go and do that. Feel free to engage on our Discord channel for anything spin. And thanks for showing up. We are at our booth, and we'll take questions and hopefully have some great conversations with you afterwards as well. Thanks, everyone.